rise. The Court of Appeal Division One is now in session. Please be seated. We're here in our case at Wednesday CV uh, 17-0378, Law of the Father vs. Nat Brook. Each side will have 20 minutes to uh, present your uh, argument. Uh, opponent, you may reserve as much time as you wish for rebuttal, but you'll have to keep track of the time yourself as a clock at the podium for that purpose. We are re recording the uh, argument, and in a few days it'll be on uh, YouTube so you can watch how well you uh, did. Because we're re re recording it, though, please identify your client, your client and yourself when you put uh, in your argument so we can keep everything straight. Uh, we've read the briefs, we've where the, the, the record we've conferenced the case, so we're familiar with the facts and the argument. So when you begin your argument, please just launch right into what you w want us uh, to know. Counsel, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. My name is Kristen Schreiner, and I represent Goldberg and Osborne, LLP. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. A request to intervene is a procedural request to enter into a case. It is not a request to have the underlying merits of the proposed complaint and intervention ruled on at that time. At the time, counsel, at the time the motion for interve intervention, excuse me, is filed, can one be said to be a party? No, Your Honor. The court has to determine that you're a party. The court has to order that you're a party. And um, in fact, the case that we saw or that we cited states that until you actually the complaint, or I'm sorry, the motion to intervene is um, approved, then one is not a party before that. I know. So a motion to amend a complaint is substantially different than a motion for intervention. That is absolutely correct. A motion to amend a complaint is a complaint that's already filed. Um, and then you're obviously seeking to add additional either parties or to add additional um, to add additional claims. So a judgment by a, 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 excuse me, a decision by a judge on a motion to amend can be substantially different than one on for intervention. That's absolutely absolutely correct. Um, a motion to intervene is 100% purely procedural. If it was a situation where a court could rule on the underlying merits, almost no party would agree to file a motion to intervene knowing that it could completely um, be the end of their case on that day and that day only. And that's actually exactly what happened to Goldberg and Osborne in this case. We filed a motion to intervene simply requesting to come into a case. We never requested nor consented to have the trial court rule on the underlying merits of the complaint. By doing that, we lost our one and only day in court. We never even had the right to file our complaint. And it actually turns a motion to intervene into a dispositive motion. And there is no case law in Arizona or really any jurisdiction that supports the proposition that uh, filing a motion to intervene can actually result in your claims being completely dismissed on that day. What about just, comment D to, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. What about comment D to the restatement, section 13 on judgments? Doesn't that provide authority for the proposition that the trial court used? It actually doesn't. Um, that, and I'm also going to discuss the Wright v. Miller, because or uh, the Wright and Miller treatise that's cited by Nightbrook, because those are both very similar. What they state is, first of all, the Wright Miller one talks about the Cheyenne case, and that is the one and only case that states that when um, the issues are ruled on dispositively with the motion to intervene, it can cause res judicata. And what that actually held was the motion to intervene was based only on being an indispensable party. And the court did not actually rule on the merits in that case. The Cheyenne tribe had actually tried to argue um, certain objections to a condemnation proceeding. The court didn't rule on any of those objections. Instead, the court found that the Cheyenne tribe was properly protected by, um, by the government who is already a party, 
They didn't then appeal the denial to intervene. And when they later tried to appeal the same judgment, they were not allowed to because they had only argued that they were an indispensable party. There was no merits ruling in that case. Had the court in the Cheyenne case actually gone on and said, um, you know, the, the Cheyenne tribe's uh, objections to the condemnation proceeding are inappropriate or, you know, we're not going to take them, that would have been a ruling on the merits and that would have been akin to this case. That's not what we have here. And the second treatise that, that you mentioned, Your Honor, discusses um, the only way that it can happen is if there's an indispensable party or something like statute of limitations or futility. That was not the case here. If we had filed a motion to intervene and the trial court had found that the statute of limitations had um, already run, that would be a futility argument. That would be the only standard that we could ever apply to a motion to intervene, and that's legal futility. That is not merits-based futility. It might be that maybe down the road our claims might not make it, but they're certainly not legally futile at this point, and they weren't at the time that we filed the motion to intervene. Uh, is there an independent action for you against not working all of a sudden in the series? Where, where, where are you with that? Our independent action was completely ruled um, precluded based on this order and this order alone. So we have suffered real and actual prejudice. Um, the court in our separate action found that because of this order, we could not file our separate claims. So through the denial of our motion to intervene, we lost our due process rights, we lost our access to the courts, and we lost our one and only day in court. Um, well, so are, are you arguing that the court was went wrong to deny your motion to intervene or are you arguing or are you also arguing or there's a little phrase that that the current denial of the motion to uh, uh, intervene went, went too far that it's the second one your honor um, the court had discretion to rule against our motion to intervene our motion to intervene was because we claimed we had an interest in the settlement money we thought it would be more efficient at that time to bring the claims under that case if the court felt it did not meet the the requirements of rule 24 that's something that we're not necessarily um, appealing what we are appealing is the second part of the order which went well beyond just simply saying you don't meet the the requirements of a motion to intervene but we're actually going to, but the court actually ruled on our merits of the case, a case that wasn't filed even. And that's what we're appealing at this point. But you had attached a complaint to your motion to intervene, a proposed that's, complaint. That, that's correct. And I mean, procedurally, that's what you have to do. And attaching a complaint and explaining why you have a right to intervene does not equate to asking a court or for a court to take a step further and to dismiss all of your claims <coughs> at that point. There was no discovery done. There was no affidavits. There was no testimony. For a court to make that type of ruling at that point in time when there is zero precedent in Arizona or anyone else is a severe consequence. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you had a question, Your Honor. Um, well, I, well I, I, I do, my kids. If we were to rule in your favor, what, what does that do for you? What would it do for us? Yeah. Well, first of all, we would then be able to proceed with our separate claim. That is what our goal would be because at the time we thought, as I'm, I know you've read the record, when we filed our sec second complaint, um, our understanding was that this case was being dismissed and so that was our avenue. Um, and at that point, then later, Nightbrook filed a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment based on the order language alone and it was granted. So we would then use the corrected order in this case to then proceed with our separate complaint. Um, our, our purpose of efficiency is is long since passed at this point in having everyone go back and, and, and do it through the motion to intervene. Um, Your Honor, returning a little bit to, to the case law that I discussed earlier or that I was touching on, every single case that has considered this issue or a similar issue has found that a motion to intervene should not rule on the merits of a case. The merits of a case are not before a court when you're doing a motion to intervene. It's strictly procedural, as this court found in um, uh, FCF v. Fink, that when you're a motion to intervene is simply, it's a method. It's a way to come into a case. Nothing about Rule 24, nothing in Rule 24, prescribes any type of rule or even any standard for ruling on the merits of a case. 
Uh, the closest standard, as we discussed earlier, would, I guess, be a futility argument, but that would just be us inserting language into a rule. We would actually have to be rewriting Rule 24 at this point to allow a court to rule on the underlying merits. How did the trial court get to this point? I assume that there was, in, it's probably in the record, and I may, I may have looked at it and forgotten by now, but did Nightbrook, when they opposed your motion to intervene, argue that you had failed to state a claim? And you guys had a response to that, or is this something the court added on its own? Uh, Nightbrook has never argued that we failed to state a claim. They never argued 12b-6. Um, they just simply argued against why we were seeking to intervene. We were seeking, no, no, <laughs> we were seeking to intervene based on um, efficiency purposes and because we had interest in the settlement money. But our complaint, the causes of action, were under the restatement of law um, governing attorneys, Section 43, and the tortious interference of contract claim. Um, Nightbrook, of course, said that they don't think that we had support for those claims, but they never argued futility in the briefs. They never argued failure to state a claim, um, and, and those aren't the rules for uh, for a motion to intervene in, in any event. Um, the court simply just signed Nightbrook's proposed order. Um, there was nothing, no additional language in the order. We don't know how the court necessarily came to that decision. He just signed the order that basically disposed of our mayor's claim completely. And I thought Judge Morris was going to steal my thunder on this question. Did the court at any point indicate what caused or at what point it occurred that prejudice attached? That Was there ever any indication as to what it was that required, that mandated that it be dismissed, not, not simply dismissed, but dismissed with prejudice? No, and what was actually dismissed with prejudice was the underlying case. It was the, the UIM case of Mr. Alisadi versus Nightbrook, and that was a personal injury case. That's the one we were trying to enter into um, to assert our completely separate complaint. And that's what the court actually dismissed with prejudice. It, he just included the dismissal of that case with his order denying but our motion to But then the language immediately following with prejudice uh, and that Nightbrook and its counsel have no further obligation. Where was that... What I'm trying to, I think what the two of us are asking, was that specific language litigated below, or was that just the proposed form of order at the end of it denying the motion to intervene that, that uh, Nightbrook provided? I, I see what you're asking, Your Honor. We certainly objected to that language when we received a, the proposed form of order in their response brief and said, this is completely inappropriate, and we cited many of the same cases that we cite in the appellate brief. When you say that, are you talking about the provision that says it is further ordered that this case be immediately dismissed with prejudice? and that defendant Nightbrook and its counsel have no further obligations with regard to any lien against plaintiff Majed Al-Assadi? Correct. It was the second sentence that you just read. On the same day that the court denied our motion to intervene, he dismissed the case with finality, the underlying case. But doesn't that say, like, I, and, and the way I read it, I, I guess I tend to be fairly comprehensive on these things, no further obligations with regard to any lien against plaintiff Majed Al-Assadi. That seems pretty comprehensive. That is, and that's actually the exact language that we're appealing. That's the language that we're saying was inappropriately decided because it wasn't before the courts. That's a merit decision. The only thing that was before the court in terms of our motion to intervene was can we enter into the case. That's all Rule 24 allows a court to decide. Um, and the court could have said, we don't think it's appropriate for intervention at this time. This case is basically settled. I'm dismissing it right now. Why reopen it? That would have been an appropriate order. That's not a time predicated statement. You with me? I mean, that's any lien. Any lien, any time. Correct. You're precluded. Correct. So, In so if the, if the ordinance had less lien, that would have been different? I'm sorry, if what? If the court, if the order had said less lien, would that be different? No, that would also have been a ruling on the underlying merits. Again, that is what our complaint was about, and that complaint was never filed. There's a difference between entering into a case and what you need to come into a case versus the underlying claims of your proposed complaint and intervention. That is a substantive issue. That is an issue that if Nightbrook wanted to, if we were allowed to file our complaint, they would have to file a motion for summary judgment or a motion to dismiss. But what the court did was actually took the causes of action in our complaint and decided on them while simultaneously denying us the right to even file them. That turned a motion to intervene into a dispositive motion. 
There is absolutely no precedent, precedent, and this has never happened that we could find. And I, I searched <laughs> in all of the federal case law, all of the state case law. This has never been allowed to happen. The only case, the Cheyenne case that I discussed earlier, is the only one that's come anywhere close to. And that, again, wasn't an underlying merits claim. It was just if you claim to, your reasoning to get into a case is because you're an indispensable party, you can't later then attack the judgment and claim you're an indispensable party. That's it. Every single other case, the Condor case, the Enterprise case, found that a judge, when ruling on a motion to intervene, cannot go further and rule on the underlying merits of the complaint. It's, it hasn't necessarily been decided in Arizona because I think it happens so infrequently, but there is absolutely no precedence for Nightberg's argument. Um, I'm going to go quickly to, to the second part of our argument, though. Even if this court finds that the court could have ruled on the merits of our complaint and intervention, uh, the ruling was still in error. Uh, again, we have no standard to apply because Rule 24 doesn't prescribe any standard for ruling on the merits of a claim. But the closest one we would, I guess, apply would be a 12B6 futility argument. And there's no question that had we separately filed our complaint and never tried to intervene, we wouldn't be here. We would have our day in court we would have been able to file our complaint and we would have moved on. Maybe some of those uh, claims might have been dismissed later, but that's what we have procedure for. That's what 12B6 exists for. That's what motions for summary judgment exists for. Um, we lost all of that procedure. We don't have any of the protections of, of what those rules stand for. But uh, again, had we never filed our intervention and complaint uh, and just filed it separately, our tortious interference with contract claim certainly would have survived a 12B6. At this point, the court ruled basically that we have no claim without any evidence whatsoever. We had the elements listed. It, this is, Arizona is a pleading state. There's no way that that case would have been dismissed just on its face. And same with our turning to the restatement of law. As I'm sure your honors know, Arizona applies the restatement when it's reasonable to do so, and there isn't any contradictory um, law or statute on the books. So in order for this court to affirm the trial court's order, it would actually be finding that the restatement doesn't apply in Arizona. And it would be, I guess, finding that our uh, tortious interference claim failed on its face, which it, it didn't. <laughs> There's no way it could have. And again, that's not in the order. That's just us having to guess what the, what the court was thinking. Um, there's plenty of cases in Arizona that have replied the restatement of law governing attorneys. It's just that this certain section 43 has not yet been discussed by a court. Um, Nightbrook's argument is, well, if a court hasn't adopted it, then it shouldn't apply. But that's backwards, actually, from what the Arizona rule is. Arizona applies it unless, um, unless it doesn't make sense or is unreasonable. So, Your Honors, I see I have four minutes left. If it's okay, I'd like to reserve the rest for rebuttal. Please, yes. Thank you. Counsel? Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is John Belanger, and together with Adam Campbell, we represent Appellee Nightbrook Insurance Company. Uh, I'm going to skip to any of the, the facts or the background of the case at judge's invitation. This is a purely legal issue on appeal, and identification of that issue is of critical importance here. Goldberg and Osborne framed the issue in their opening brief as, did the trial court err when it ruled on the merits of Goldberg and Osborne's claim while simultaneously denying Goldberg and Osborne's right to bring the claim by means of intervention. In our response brief, we framed the issue as whether the trial court, as a matter of law, properly entered an order regarding the merits of Goldberg and Osborne's claims against Nightbrook. Issues that weren't presented for appeal are whether or not the denial of the motion to intervene was proper, and more importantly, the substance of the trial court's ruling on the merits. Uh, the well, uh, it, it seems like uh, no one's taking issue with the, the denial of a motion to uh, uh, intervene. The question is whether the, or the order otherwise went too far. Correct, Your Honor. And what is being presented is whether Judge Udall could have, not whether he should have. And any attempt to address the restatement or any of the underlying arguments 
was not presented on appeal and, and the reply brief improperly attempts to expand the appellate issue here. Counsel, do you have any authority for us stating that that a court can enter orders precluding with prejudice the filing of a complaint by a non-party to the action? The secondary sources that were cited for the court stand for that proposition. Opposing counsel... You don't have to be named in the action. You don't have to do anything that implicates your ability to even defend the objection to it. You don't have any standing to do that. So you can be precluded from ever having the chance to bring an action. Correct, Your Honor. If you look at pages four and five of the reply brief, the uh, cases that are string cited there and actually support that, and then the secondary authorities provide additional illustration of that point. That doesn't sound very uh, consistent with the process to uh, uh, to order that a non party can't pursue a, a, a claim. We're dealing with a little bit of a unique circumstance here, Your Honor. Neither party could find a case on point where the uh, threshold question of whether or not there was a cognizable legal claim was presented and argued extensively to the trial court and then a ruling on the merits, whether or not that claim could be brought. All of the cases speak to indispensable party uh, and appellate issues in that vein. The second, excuse me, the secondary authorities support the proposition that if you fail to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, then the merits order on the motion to intervene can stand and can preclude a second suit. Well, let's, let's talk about that. You can't find any cases. Show me a rule that says in the motion to intervene context that a court can reach the merits of the underlying claim. The well, 24 doesn't say that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Your Honor. The cases don't set out a specific fact pattern where this similar situation occurred. But if you look at Beacon, citing Turnkey, citing Oneida, they talk about the request to intervene as a front-end uh, inquiry as to whether intervention is proper. And the court has to determine whether or not the prospective intervener has claimed an interest. And the issue to be determined is simply whether or not the prospective intervener has alleged plausible facts that claim an interest. Recasting that, the issue here is whether or not Goldberg and Osborne had an interest that would be impeded or impaired if intervention was denied. For purposes of allowing an intervention, not not on the, 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 the independent merits of the claim. Well, if, uh, no, Your Honor, actually, if you go further in the Beacon case, they talk about um, the application can, for intervention can be resolved on the merits by, or excuse me, by reference to the ultimate merits of the claim of the intervener if the allegations are frivolous on their face. Beacon goes further to liken the situation to that of a motion to dismiss or motion for summary judgment. We're going to take all well-pled facts in support of the moving party, and if the claim doesn't cross the threshold test, not legally uh, cognizable, uh, can't uh, recover on it ultimately, then the intervention can be denied. Well, whether uh, uh, Goldberg and Osborne would be successful or not, it seems far from frivolous, doesn't it? Apparently, Judge Udall didn't think so, Your Honor. <laughs> what about, the, what about the, their right to be able to claim, whether you agree with that or not, whether I agree with it or not, what about their right to assert that they had an agreement that had been breached? That doesn't sound frivolous on its face to me. Well, important distinction is that this motion to intervene was sought only against Nightbrook. They did not seek to intervene as against al Asadi change to assert to the, the, I'm sorry. the client agreement, Your Honor. And change it to the next perspective. These are torts. You're, you're talking about torts then. And so we're going to say that they don't have a right to, to, to object to tortious conduct that hasn't in any fashion been developed in the case yet? Again, we're dealing with a unique situation where we don't have factual precedent to point to, Your Honor. But don't we have to follow, the issue of due process came up, don't we have to follow some, some quantum of, of general practice, general rules, prior decisions, implicating the general aspects of this before we jump into an area that has no case support, case law to support it whatsoever? I think you've got to dive back down into the record uh, beneath. 
This okay, wait, motion. Wait. When did they get a chance to dive back into the record down? Below? No, 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 I'm sorry for that analysis and to answer that question, okay. Your Honor. We All need right. to. Uh, this the motion to intervene didn't simply ask. We have an interest in the settlement proceeds under 24A2. Please allow us to intervene. Motion to intervene was 10 pages long and set forth the, the factual and legal basis for asserting the claims uh, attorney charging lien under Restatement 43, intentional interference. Reply, or response brief was 11 pages long. Reply brief was 10 pages long. Goldberg and Osborne chose to put this in front of Judge Udall. And when the, after we responded and said, these claims aren't legally cognizable, they don't present a claim upon which relief can be granted, you should deny this motion. The reply brief didn't stop and say, no, 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 hold on. You're only deciding whether or not we've got an interest and we should intervene. It again doubled down and argued the merits of the claims. And Judge Udall just made that threshold inquiry and decided they weren't le legally cognizable and they could not present a claim upon which relief could be granted. And I guess I get lost at the point to where you tell me that the assertion that they have a, a, a feeling that they want to assert and that they're being denied uh, the payment uh, that they're owed, how that can be seen as, as, as a frivolous claim or a or an, a, a not recognized in law. I mean, how do you get there from here? And to the extent that they, in one point they put a good position out, but in another position, but in another point in their pleading they put something in there that maybe is a little more iffy. I mean, I'm not trying to pass judgment one way or another, but isn't this a situation where it's it's a it, there has to be an absence of any support for their position to decide that it's absolutely not legally cognizable, right? Agreed, Your Honor. Okay. And that's what Judge Udall found. That, and I don't mean to parse, but that's the important distinction here. Parse that you want to. The, <laughs> the intervention was not sought against Mr. Al-Asadi. If it was, absolutely. That legally, that uh, attorney charging lien is actionable. But there is zero support in Arizona whatsoever that there is third party responsibility for an attorney charging lien. That's the distinction. But, but the, the, the order says uh, that uh, that uh, if Tesla has no further obligation to refer anything against Al Saudi. So are you saying that an action against Al Saudi isn't is not covered by by the soldier that Goldberg and Osborne can and if you should have Proceeded against Al Asadi. Absolutely, Your Honor. My reading of the order, and, and I and I think that's clear, is that Nightbrook was relieved from any additional obligations or arguments of obligations under the lien. That did not foreclose Goldberg and Osborne from proceeding against Mr. Al Asadi. And in fact, that claim exists in the second case that was filed before Judge Rogers and remains. Um, I thought you were going to go somewhere else, and I do want to address this point because it came up on uh, the opening argument. Uh, that order arguably would preclude any medical lien recovery also, which would be in violation of our statute in Arizona. But there were no medical liens at issue in this case. There was only one lien that was recorded, and that lien was released. So there are no medical liens impacted by Judge Udall's order. Sorry, Judge Morse, I thought you were <laughs> going to ask a question. I was wrestling with what they asked. <laughs> uh, when you apply the beacon and the additional cases that it cites and the secondary authorities to the facts at bar here, there's only one reasonable conclusion that can be drawn from the language of the order. And that's that Judge Udall's order rests on the substance of the claims advanced. Again, the motion to intervene did not simply ask, we've got an interest in the property, let us intervene. They spend 10 pages arguing the legal basis for the claims they want to present. And the uh, uh, contemplated complaint is attached to that motion. Is your argument, I'm sorry. So your view is that, that in response to my earlier question, uh, there is no due process violation here because for purposes of this case, Goldberg and Osborne is a party, even though the motion to intervene is to determine whether that ought to be a part of it or not. Your view is that for due process purposes, they were a party. Our view is that they had their day in court, Your Honor. These issues were absolutely fleshed out, and not only were they fleshed out, 
they were presented for fleshing out in consideration to the court were by gold. Were, were they able to do all the things that a party would be able to do to pursue it in, to pursue a claim in an independent action, like discovery and all, and all the other rights are, are attendant? There, there was no discovery on these issues, Your Honor, but as in any other case where a new complaint is filed, if the trial judge determines that there isn't a claim presented that's legally cognizable and nothing upon which relief can be granted, no discovery is going to be afforded in that case either. So this basically became a 12B motion. Um, there's no legal precedent for that, Your Honor, but I, I guess that's the analogy you, you'd have to make. I'm going to ask you for your precedent for that the same way <clears throat> I asked you for the earlier precedent. Again, well, and counsel made the point that we can't find a case that allowed this. Well, there's not a case that said this was done in error either. There simply isn't a case that we could find that presented this fact pattern. Beacon and the string of cases talk about this threshold inquiry, and then the secondary sources are further uh, instructive about prejudicial effect of an order denying a motion to intervene when the claims presented in that motion intervene are not legally cognizable and relief could not be granted on them. Let's, let me ask a kind of a broader question about cases, though. You, you've said you can't find a case under these facts. But isn't there a lot of case law in Arizona, or at least some case law in Arizona, saying for a judgment to have a preclusive effect, there has to be identity of parties? And by denying the motion to intervene, there is no identity of parties here. <clears throat> The briefs go into uh, our argument, Your Honor, that Goldberg and Osborne did present as a party in this case. Uh, and I need to, with apologies, give oh, a little bit of background information. Oh, no, I, I, and I'm, we're relatively familiar with the background. But so your argument would then be that even though the court denied the motion to intervene, it didn't. It let them have their day in court. So therefore, they're a party, but then denied the motion to intervene. And yes, and even further than that, Goldberg and Osborne, prior to the motion to intervene, had submitted filings in the case contrary to the interests of their former client. And our argument uh, points to that as well as them acting as a party in interest in the case. But there's, again, any case law for supporting that notion that someone who tries to intervene is a party? or who files something that may or may not be in the interest of their client. I mean, it seems like, and, and maybe you disagree with me, but there's the rules are pretty similar, and this is similar to the federal rule on intervention here. This is something that would have come up if before. Well, I don't think so, Your Honor. And the reason being, all the cases we see are where intervention was denied, and you're looking at the uh, necessary party cases. If the intervention were granted, which we're, we really need a case of the opposite that then someone challenged in order to have case law supporting that point. And if intervention was with you on that one, because it seems like you're asking us to say Rule 24, even though it doesn't say it, incorporates a Rule 12b6 standard. And Rule 24 somehow allows preclusive effect of a denial to intervene and also makes a party a not a party. I mean you're and, and you may be right, but it seems to me that you're asking for us to expand, interpret, reinterpret the law to say things that aren't exactly explicit in it. Not Rule 24, Your Honor. Looking at the beacon and the string of cases cited therein, as well as the secondary authorities, uh, I would offer that the secondary authorities both contemplate this exact situation where intervention is denied in an order on the merits because the claim was not legally cognizable, that relief couldn't be granted under it. And well, but Beacon talks about the standard, but it doesn't talk about the preclusive effect of that standard. I mean, the, the court can consider the validity of the claim, but it doesn't say, and you're therefore locked out for all eternity. But that wasn't the issue before the court in Beacon, unfortunately, then, so it does not. You're correct. Therein lies the rub. If that's not the issue before the court, what right did the court have to decide that issue with prejudice? Why, why did I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm why not did following. Prejudice, we, at what point did an act occur that resulted in a, the necessity of dismissing with prejudice? In Beacon or in our case? Our case. Our ca again, Goldberg and Osborne uh, put this before the court. It asked the court to consider the to decide it. They, they asked the court to decide this matter with prejudice because prejudice attached. Our position is yes, Your Honor. They're essentially form shopping and trying to take multiple bites at the apple. You do give you this have to the trial a court. Pleading? Do you have a pleading or any 
text of, uh, of an argument before the court where they asked that if it was going to be a dismissal, it would be a dismissal with prejudice. No, what we've got is when the proposed order that was signed unaltered by Judge Udall submitted with our response, Goldberg and Osborne objected to it in the reply, but again, the objection was don't include the last sentence. It wasn't don't consider our merits because they argue the merits all over again. Well, what they should have done in the reply to go that far, and I, I'm sorry, Judge Howe, what, what they should have done in the reply to facilitate the argument you're presenting is, Hold on, no, Judge Udall, you can't properly consider the merits. All you're deciding is, do we have an interest in the settlement proceeds under 24A2? And they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. They doubled down again and gave him the merits. So they, they actually invited, it's basically an invited error situation, you're, you're arguing. But, and we would argue uh, judicial estoppel. Uh, they, they, they presented the merits, and now they want to say, well, now hold on, Judge Udall shouldn't have considered those. Counsel, it... They asked to intervene because they claim an interest in the, the proceeds. You responded that they have no claim. It doesn't seem remarkable to me that once you make that argument that you know, judge, they shouldn't be allowed to intervene because their claim is meritless. It doesn't seem remarkable to me to have them argue, well, I, my claim is. My, 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 Has merit, correct. It does have merit. Sure. So it, it seems unfair to say that because I responded to your argument, that means that the merits are, are now before the, the court. You've got to step back one step, Your Honor. We responded to their argument that the purported claims would have merit. So we got to go back to, again, the motion to intervene, even where they could have maybe corrected this issue in the reply, the motion to intervene didn't simply say, we've got an interest in the settlement proceeds under 24A2, please allow us to intervene. But you've it told us presented, it requires them to establish that they have some meritorious claim in order to qualify for intervention. If we, if we read through Beacon, that's the threshold or the front-end inquiry that the court has to make. If, uh, if there's a challenge as to whether or not the claims are meritorious. I mean, you're arguing a kind of a, a, a catch-22. Because if they hadn't asserted that there's a meritorious claim, then the court would have should, should have just denied intervention as a matter of law. But the fact that they asserted they had merit to their claim means they're now stuck with it. Is that no? Well, and I that would make this, every motion to intervene a motion a ruling on the merit. I think this goes back to Judge Howe's question. If the motion to intervene had simply been 24A2, we've got an interest in the property. Then the response had come. There's no legally cognizable claim making those arguments, and they replied. I might agree with you, Your Honor. They had their day in court. They presented the merits of the claims for Judge Udall's consideration. And the secondary authorities tell us that do they, do they have all the procedural protections under Rule 12b? <clears throat> I cannot think of anything that would have differed in our response had we been dealing with a 12b motion as opposed to this motion. I, I can't think of anything either. I just want to make sure because it see, you're basically asking us to incorporate Rule 12B into Rule 24, like a Rule 12B standard. Because that's the only way the court could dismiss it because they weren't entitled. They didn't get Rule 56 type protections. They didn't have an opportunity for discovery, anything like that. So it would have to be a, an incorporation of Rule 12B6, right? The case, I, I, I'm going to agree. <laughs> Conditionally, the case law, Beacon and the, and the uh, prior cited cases and the secondary authority suggest exactly that without saying that you've got to read that standard in, that the court's got to perform that front end inquiry of, uh, and there was comment about uh, likening it to a motion to amend. Are we dealing with something that's futile here? And if so, we're going to deny and that's going to have preclusive effect. Counsel, isn't it the case that if, if we uh, publish this as an opinion and it becomes uh, and your position becomes uh, the law, if you will. Aren't we just doing away with Rule 24 motions? Because who's going to who's going to run that risk? Who's going to run that risk? 
I don't believe so, Your Honor. Again, our pos if if the motion to intervene had been nothing more than we have an interest in settlement proceeds, we wouldn't be here today either. That intervention would have been granted or denied, and if it was denied, the second case could have gone forward. But it was Goldberg and Osborne choosing to put the merits before Judge Udall and have their day in court to argue now that, whoa, no, hold on, the merits shouldn't have been considered. It's forum shopping, taking two bites at the apple, judicial estoppel, however we want to call that, but that behavior shouldn't be encouraged or endorsed. Thanks. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you. I, how much of the merits did you present um, in actually, to intervene? Your Honor, that's exactly what I was going to address first. Um, our reply brief specifically said over and over again that the merits were not before the court, that we didn't have any discovery, that we didn't have any way to present the merits of our tortious interference with contract claim. I'm not sure where um, my colleague's statement is that we didn't argue that in the reply because that's absolutely what we argued in the reply. We said that the merits aren't before the court because we don't have enough to put the merits before the court. What we have put before the court is our request to assert these claims. And that is exactly word for word what we argued to the lower court. Um, again, it, there was comment about how the court found our claims futile, and that's why he made that decision. That exists nowhere in the record. That's just us assuming, because the only thing we can think of is applying a 12B6 standard. That conclusion was never made, and that was certainly never argued by Nightbrook down below in the, in the trial court. Let me ask you the question I ask opposing counsel. If, if this becomes the law, you're ever going to file a Rule 24 motion again? I sure wouldn't. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I don't. If you don't file the attachment, you lose. If you do file the attachment, you lose. That's exactly right, Your Honor, and that's that's what we what we argue in our briefs is that simply because we put in why um, our, what our causes of action are is not a request to have the merits ruled on. Anytime you're going to ask a court to intervene in a case, you need to say what your interest is, which was our um, interest in the settlement money. But you also should <laughs> explain a little bit about what your complaint is. To say that just writing a 10-page brief is your one and only day in court, um, that is not, there's no precedent for that. There's no standard for that. You lose all protections, as, as, as Your Honor talked about, under 12b-6 in a motion for summary judgment. Um, we are just speculating, again, that the court found our claims to be futile. That's not argued anywhere. Um, that's not ordered anywhere. And if the court did find them to be futile, that was an error under a 12b-6 standard. So even if that were the case, which again is just us guessing, uh, that would also be an error in that um, order, the language in that order should be stri struck. In, struck. <laughs> and Your Honors, um, I heard a lot of talk about Beacon and about how there's no cases that, that consider this similar issue. That's absolutely incorrect. There's only one case, as I mentioned, which is the Cheyenne case that talked about indispensable parties. And excuse me for reading, but I want to get this exactly right. Beacon held, because the question of intervention is a threshold inquiry, resolution of the merits of the prospective intervener's proposed pleading or of the, existing, of the existing case would be inappropriate. That's exactly what Beacon held. They went on to say, although a motion um, judge may hear arguments on the motion or hold evidentiary hearings to resolve ambiguities where the motion to intervene is not clearly understood, it is legally inappropriate at such an early stage to make findings regarding a prospective intervener's claimed interest. And that's exactly what we had in this case. The Condor case says similar things. All of our cases, there's, we have to point out, as your honors have also mentioned, there's not a single case cited by Nightbrook supporting its position. The only thing it cites is the secondary sources, and the secondary sources are based on the cases, which I've just explained to you. The Enterprise case, which came after Cheyenne, which is also in the Eighth Circuit, said that Cheyenne does not hold what Nightbrook is holding. It went on to say that you cannot uh, rule on the underlying merits, that you have a right to bring those underlying merits in a separate action if you are precluded. And I, I see I'm out of time. It just, um, if I could just conclude briefly. Um, I, I, we would request that this court um, strike the language of the order that uh, makes the ruling on the merits of the lien claim and simply just deny the intervention. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tampa. We uh, appreciate your arguments uh, today. We'll take this matter under advisement and we'll issue uh, our uh, decision in due course. We're going to stand at recess, but we're going we're going to remain on the bench to allow the, the second case to come up. Thank you very much. Thank you.